So once again, good morning. It's uh, great to be with you this morning. Um, yeah, I'm so uh, grateful to be back. Um, if you have a Bible with you, open it to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 16 to 24 this morning. Um, we're back in the series in the Sermon on the Mount called The Good Life, Human Flourishing According to Jesus, which we've been in for a while and took a little bit of a break over the summer uh, because we had some guest speakers and stuff like that while I was away. So I just want to thank in advance or before we get into the word this morning, Rudy, who took on a couple of Sundays and then three of the men from uh, our big sister church in Abbotsford called Northview. And we had Adam, Sean, and last week, Jonathan here. Thanks to those guys, very capable men who brought some really good messages and gave me an opportunity to get some rest and some prayer about ministry for the fall and gave you a break from me. Amen. I know, I know how that goes, and it is a good thing. So yeah, it's really good to be back. Um, I had in mind this morning, because of where we're at, that I was going to do a brief recap, but good news, we're just going to dive right in, okay? And that was mainly for Daryl at the back, I thought I would say that, okay? So, and here's the thing, Uh, there's a lot, and I want to encourage you, uh, those of you who are here today and you haven't been following along, or if you're watching online, you can go back and get all of our podcasts on iTunes or on our YouTube channel. Um, just to go back and get, a, get caught up on what we've been looking at in this sermon series, and, and not because of me, but this is Jesus preaching this sermon, amen? Th- this is the greatest sermon ever preached. The lessons in this are incredible. We, we saw from the very beginning him going through the Beatitudes, the blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then on and on he went, and finally he got to, really in that first chapter, the real hinge that launches everything else in the the passage, in the sermon, to what we're also going to see today. And that's from chapter 5, verse 20, where Jesus challenges his listeners. The verse will be on screen for you to look at. He challenges his listeners, listeners saying, listen, the righteousness of those who are mine, who are my disciples, will exceed that of the religious Pharisees. Well, in the day at that time when those who heard that, heard that, they're like, okay, hold on. Those guys are the righteous ones. And Jesus goes on in the rest of the sermon, and including today, to basically say this, not so much. In a lot of ways, not so much. So we're going to look at a, a really fantastic passage today. Two things put together where at first, when you hear them read together and put together, you're going to go, how do they fit? I hope I'll be able to show you that this morning. So I'm going to read the whole text and then pray one more time and we'll dive in. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. Jesus speaking. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast... Anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Pray with me, would you? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much. As we were praying upstairs earlier that we, we, we get to be here today. We're not... It's not an obligation, it's a want, it's a need, it's a desire to to get to be here today because you've drawn us, you've you've drawn us to yourself. We want to know more about you, who you are, and what you've done. And as we read this text today, Lord Jesus, oh, we're so thankful that first you came 
And then secondly, you lived the life that you lived. And then thirdly, from this text this morning, that you were willing to take your time to slowly teach the disciples and us here today as well so that we might understand the good life, the the life of true flourishing that you really do want for us, that you've purchased for us with your own blood. So Holy Spirit, I I pray. I pray that you would take these words today, these uh, simple thoughts and ideas that you've given to me to teach us about this text more deeply and fully, I hope. I pray that you would do that work and encourage my brothers and sisters here today and watching online with these words, with your word. And I pray this in your worthy name, Jesus. Amen. So I have a sermon title for you and three points. I like to say I don't always have that for you, but hey, it was there. So your sermon title for today is Life's Greatest Treasure. Hope to show you three things about that. Life's greatest treasure is greater than, number one, physical need, two, greater than material need, three, greater than financial need. Some of you probably know where this is going, but hold on. (laughs) Let's see where it goes. So I I have a question for you. Some of you are like, okay, Glenn's back. (laughs) We're starting with questions. That's how I approach anything like this. I approach the text and these stories and go, what what, what's, what's happening here? What does this mean? What can we learn from this? So the question I have for you this morning is this. Have you ever awoken one morning? You know, you're fresh and you wake up, you know, and then even before the coffee or during your day you're walking around and, and, and you're kind of praying about it and thinking about your life, kind of analyzing things. And, and then all of a sudden, whether it's early in the morning or later when you're walking around, like there's like a flash of lightning, you get an epiphany. And all of a sudden you realize, I want to become a minimalist. <laughs> I'm not sure why that's funny. Right? What, what nobody? You, you've never woken up and had that, that, that happen to you? I mean, like, it's, looking into it, I mean, I th- I've seen this before, but I don't know if you know this. There's a podcast out there called The Minimalist, two guys, and like, it's very popular, like hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million subscribers listen to these guys all the time, and they, they, they want to, you know, they want to indoctrinate you into minimalism, and they're really good at it, by the way. Anybody remember Marie Kondo from a few years ago? Anybody? <laughs> the rest of you are just not being honest. Just one hand went up, right? Right? I mean, she had this show. It was on Netflix. And uh, I hated that show. I got to be honest with you. She was all about, you know, like organizing your closets and your drawers and getting rid of stuff and learning how to fold your socks and stuff. So, and, and Janice, she loved that show, right? And she would say to me, honey, here's what's going to happen. This week, you're going to work on your drawers. Yeah. <clears throat> and then next week, it's going to be the closet, right? And, and, this is, and then you're going you're gonna to put everything aside that, that you don't want to keep, that you're not going to wear this year or you're not going to use, and we're going to put it in bags and take it down to pearls, right? I guarantee you their in, from inventory during that series went up 100%, right? People got into it, and then they didn't, right? right? My drawers look like they used to look, okay? <laughs> it's the same now, right? So the, the question is, well, I, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I never had that epiphany. Personally, I never really had that epiphany. And so, again, the question is, well, for most of us, why is that? Why is it that we haven't had that epiphany, really, okay? So, well, one reason has to be it's, it's not a lifestyle, quite frankly, that I ever heard taught in my home, in school, or in the church. I never heard anybody talking about minimalism, easy for me to say, three times fast. I've never heard it. I, I didn't hear it being presented or modeled by anybody who I knew. And in fact, from my perspective, it seems to me from my observation over the years, it's a way of life that people adopt at some point in their lives, sometimes listen for good and healthy reasons, for good and healthy reasons, but not always. Sometimes... I mean, one negative reason might be because people have, you know, they've, they've tried to get a good job and make more money and, and be able to buy the kind of things that everybody else is buying and, and be able to have the kind of things that other people have. And they get a little discouraged because it isn't, it isn't working. And so all of a sudden, almost out of a sense of bitterness, they become religious minimalists, right? And it can become, become quite negative. Right? Talking about, well, you know, the reason why housing prices in Squamish are so terrible is because, well, government and social policies, and, and then there's those rich people who can actually afford them. 
okay, that went over well. But it can go that way. It can go that way. That's not good. But another reason why I think most people don't hear that lifestyle call, and I want to suggest to you it, there's some good things there, as we will, I hope, see in conclusion, is definitely because there is another way of life, a lifestyle that is taught, modeled, and driven into our consciousness, not just our subconsciousness, but into our consciousness from our very infancy, a way of life that is sold as the surefire way to arrive at what? The good life. And what is that way of life? Oh, and none of you are going to like this, these titles but it's either to become a consumerist or a materialist. So, my observation would be, I think some of you might agree, is that all of us living in the North American context have been raised to be consumers. We've been raised to be consumers. It's modeled for us in our homes as we watch mom and dad go what? Shopping. (laughs) I remember, because I'm old enough, I'm old enough, I remember when the first mall opened in Toronto. Like it was a magnet. It was instantly successful. Instantly. And so we notice as kids, as little ones, we notice that despite the fact that mom will go to the grocery store or to any store with an actual list, when, when, when mom or dad, for that matter, gets to the checkout, I got to be careful here, gets to the checkout, you know, there are those things at the checkout, those impulse buy things, All of a sudden, as kids, we see mom and dad going, oh, one of those, oh, and one of those, (laughs) into the basket. They weren't on the list, but we're buying them. And that is also, by the way, when you walk through the grocery store with your lovely little ones, right, and they get to that shelf, which is, it's it's amazing. It's placed right at their eye level, and and what's on that shelf is 85% sugar, right? And please, mom, they're consumers, and, and why did they even, like, why did they see that box of cereal? Well, where did they see it? Why did they want that one? Because they saw it on TV, maybe, possibly. Consumer heaven, right? So also look at it this way. <clears throat> Much of our educational system is geared towards pumping out the next generation of consumers. You ever thought about it that way? Hmm. I mean, sure, we, we go to school to learn the basics of a good education, but, but listen, let me ask you, to what end? What is the end of the education? Well, the end is, uh, well, to get a good job so you can actually move into the house. Mom and dad are like, amen, right? And you can start to look after yourself. But now what do you got to do? Well, you get your first apartment. What do you got to do? You got to furnish it. You got to buy the stereo. You got to get the TV. You got to get all that stuff in there. On it goes, right? You, 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 you and I have been conditioned to begin, when we get our job, to immediately start spending our money to fuel, and i got to tell you, it's a voracious appetite, the economic engine. You do realize if we all stop spending, it would all collapse, right? If we all stop buying. But that's the way it's set up. And so if we do well, the, the whole idea is um, we eventually start buying our own stuff, and maybe one day, buying the American dream. And I apologize in advance because I know for some people living in Squamish, this is becoming a nightmare. But the the dream is to, and it's always been, to buy a single family home, right? But here's the thing. I remember when we were living in Langley and we did buy our first, well, our second actually single family home. Everybody was talking, it was not just any home. Like, no, I I want a 3,000 square foot home. Not exactly a minimalist idea. Why do I want that? Well, because, you know, we need this room for me and that room for her and them and whatever. And, and now you've got to furnish that sucker. Oh, and, and it's got to have two garages at least. Why? Because you have two cars? Well, probably, but what else? Toys. I have stuff in my garage, Janice will point this out to you, that I haven't used in one year. All summer, she threatened to take my paddleboard back to Costco. Just being honest. So listen, I will confess to you that in my younger days, I bought into this mantra, hook, line, and sinker. Like totally. (laughs) In my business days, especially. I heard the sayings, or a saying like, the guy with the most toys when he dies wins, and my thought was, game on. That was my thinking. And I think it was the thinking of an awful lot of people. I'll share more on that with you later about how that all came crashing down on me. But for now, let's just say this. We have all, in some way or another, 
either fully bought into this way of life or at least been susceptible to the desire for more and more stuff. At some point in our life, some of us might actually think the tenets of minimalism are not a bad idea. So throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been showing his great love for his disciples and for you and I by teaching them what it really looks like, what it really looks like to live the good life. And as we've seen so far, it is totally counter to not only what most people in that day thought, it's incredibly counter to our culture and, listen, even to church culture in a lot of ways. His desire is for them and for you and I to truly, truly flourish in this life. That's his desire. It truly is. So I love the parallel passage in Luke's gospel in chapter 12 where it appears at some point he's he's preaching to the Pharisees, he's going after them, he's preaching to the crowds, and all of a sudden he turns all of his attention just on his disciples, and he does for the rest of Luke's gospel. And the reason primarily for that is he just wants to prepare them. (laughs) He wants to prepare them for when he ascends and is gone and puts them in charge of the mission And what he knows is going to come upon them, not only through opposition and and, and attacks by the the enemy, the devil, but also the culture, not the culture being bad, but the culture of consumerism and materialism and how that could easily take them off the game. And he spends his time warning them and teaching them. Why? Because his heart was to protect them by preparing them for the true good life. And that is exactly what he's doing here today in the Sermon on the Mount at this point in the text. So let's look at point number one. Life's greatest treasure is greater than our physical need. Verse 16 says this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. So it's interesting that Jesus speaks about fasting here. If, you, if you're reading the context and going along, it's like, fasting? <laughs> that seems to come out of the blue, right? And, and it's, it's interesting also that it, he doesn't teach about fasting, really. He doesn't tell you the, the reasons why you should fast or how to fast or the benefits of fasting. He doesn't go into that. And the reason is quite clear. He's trying to get to a different point. <laughs> But he's also, as you will see, and I think you can see in these words, he is supporting the idea of fasting, right? So notice his words. He says, when you fast. Okay, right away. It's not an if, (laughs) but when you fast. It's an imperative. You, you, You are going to fast, right? So when you fast, he says. Then he gets to the point he really wants to make. And again, please see the words. I, when I read these words, and I was going over them in my mind over the last few weeks preparing for today, because I was excited about this, coming back and preaching this text, honestly. You see Jesus say, do not. Now, come on, you're a parent, and your child is walking towards a hot stove. What, what are some of the words that come out of your mouth? Do not touch that. Like, are you semi-serious? <laughs> like, is it, is it a mere suggestion? Or out of love, are you saying, do not do that? Please hear his words. These are imperatives. Do not, so let me repeat, do not. This is a warning, isn't it? It's it's not, again, a mere suggestion. And why? Because his point is one that he's been highlighting for quite a while now, and that is that the difference between you and I who are in Christ, who are the ones have been blessed already with the blessings of Christ, who are to be the righteous ones, are to not be what? Hypocrites. What is one of the greatest criticisms that people in uh, the world, in the community, say about Christians? Right. Oh, they're pretty holy on Sunday, but hey, have you seen them on Wednesday? Have you seen what they post on Facebook? Right? Cannot be hypocrites. So Pharisees, listen, in that day were, were very well known for making sure everyone knew that they were holy and righteous by the way they fasted. Right? Like, it, it, was, it was their thing. And, and everybody was like, yeah, very impressed by them. And why is that? Well, it was all about, the, in their mind, their righteousness was all about how they looked. Right? It was their outward behavior which really masked a sinful, sinful heart. 
And so the reality is, is they, they, would, they would literally look gloomy. They would like really look downtrodden. And in fact, what they would do they, was they would dress down. They'd take off their great hats and their great clothing, and they would dress down in, in probably black. And not only that, they would take ashes, and they would throw the ashes over their, their clothing and even onto their face and hair sometimes so that when they were walking through the marketplace, people would go, oh, look at those holy and righteous people. They're fasting. I, I'm not making this up. And that's why Jesus is getting at this. That is, that is what they would do. So what's really amazing in this text is Jesus judges them, doesn't he? He says they have received their reward. Not they will receive their reward. They have received their reward. What is it? What is their reward? Which is not a good thing. It's the approval of man. Right? It's the approval of others by look at me. There's a lot of lessons here. We don't have time to go into that for you and I, all of us, in the way that we live out our righteous Christian lives, right? Because we can be hypocritical here. So I want you to think about that and pray over that this week. Jesus, in verse 17, now starts to speak to you and I who are in Christ. He says this, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. So again, when you fast are his words. So fasting is a good thing, and as we will see, as we will see. And then in contrast to the hypocrite, Jesus says, let me, let me try to put a little bit of a fun paraphrase on this, okay? Essentially what Jesus is saying, and I'm really getting into this lately with my new style, but anyway, don't, don't. Anyway, why did I mention that? Um, but, but basically, I think he's saying something like this to them. He says, listen, w- when you get up on the morning when you're going to fast, wash your hair. Wash your hair. And listen, maybe put some product in it. Hello. And, and, and also wash your face, like freshen up. Ladies, maybe put on some makeup. And, and, and it's almost like he's saying, listen, dress up, look happy, as if you're going to church or on a date. Okay, is that too much? Is that a little bit over the top, do you think? I don't know. I don't know, really. Is it? I think what he's saying in a nutshell is, listen, when you fast, look your best. Look healthy. Don't look like you're dying. You're not going to die. Well, it depends on how long you fast for. You're not going to die. That's not the point of fasting. Look fresh and healthy, and listen, listen, then what he does is tell us what the big why is. In verse 16, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. In other words, fast in a way where nobody can tell you're fasting. <laughs> maybe, maybe your spouse or, or maybe a close friend who you're fasting with for a particular reason or purpose, that's okay, but not everybody else. You don't need to let everybody else know. Why? Because this is between you and the Lord, your heavenly Father. And it says in this text, and sometimes people take it the wrong way, he will reward you, meaning after you've finished fasting and you've been fasting about a particular issue or whatever, maybe a need, want, desire, right? No. The reward is him. The the reward is your presence and your time with him while fasting. That's what he's getting at here. The second lesson that is implied in this is the real purpose behind fasting. So do you know what the real purpose is behind fasting? Anybody? I think many of you do. Uh, It's not the popular uh, method or reason for fasting that you see in our world today and online. It's not which is often referred to as intermittent fasting. You know, like you eat in the morning and then you don't eat at lunch and then you have a meal or whatever. It's not that because the purpose behind that kind of fasting is about me. (laughs) It's about how much more healthy it'll make me feel, how it'll it improve my gut health, right? And listen, those are not bad things. Those are byproducts and those are good things, but that's not the biblical rationale for our fasting. The main purpose of biblical fasting, if you study it in the scripture, is to lead you and I to the point of disciplining ourselves. Withholding, deciding to actually withhold Hold from ourselves. Well, hold on. Sounds like minimalism, doesn't it? That's the point. 
And, and the second point to it is, and rationale behind it is, so that you will realize in your fellowship with the Lord, in your time with him while you're fasting, because you're doing it in secret for him to see and nobody else, and he will reward you and bless you in doing that, you will realize, and your point is, you are every day regardless, depending on your heavenly father for your physical sustenance. Amen? This is just a good way of getting yourself back to the point of really realizing that. So that's number one, greater than physical need. Number two, greater than material need. I love this passage. (laughs) Verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So again, you see Jesus using those great words, do not. And we must see this not as restrictive and punitive, but listen, as loving Loving, (laughs) loving. You know, Jesus has seen this movie trailer before, right? He has seen the lives of people who give themselves to heaping up treasures on earth for their lives, and he sees what happens to it. It doesn't end well almost 100% of the time. So this is a loving suggestion. His point here simply is this. Do not lay up for, see the next words in this, For yourselves, treasures where? On earth. That's the key. He's warning against, yes, selfishness and the power and allure of earthly treasures. Again, he knows this is coming. He knows that every one of his disciples who says, oh, Jesus, I thank you so much for salvation. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. Now, yes, today I'm going to take up my cross and follow you right after I go shopping. He knows the allure is going to be powerful. And so there's going to be like, Living for heavenly treasures or, man, I want that new driver. I need that new driver. Just letting you know. Someone in this room just got that. So while every Jew in that day knew, none of your earthly treasures were safe or are safe. Whether it was clothing, food, or material possessions, or your gold, your silver in that day, every Jew knew that, man, they weren't safe. They didn't have the kind of protections we have today. They didn't have bank accounts. But listen, I'll just, anyone here got any investments? Hmm. Anybody got any RRSPs? Okay. So I, I have, I have a, our, our lovely denomination has this plan where, you know, every month I can put up to a certain percentage of my, my salary, what I get paid by the church, uh, into it. And if, if whatever we put into it, they will, and this is for pastors and missionaries, so that they will have some kind of retirement income. It's not a, a pile of money, but they'll have something, right? And they will match it, which is really cool. <laughs> and so you're kind of like doubling it, right? And so every six months, the uh, company, organization that manages our fund sends out a report to us. And I'm telling you, like, I, I've been giving into it for, I don't know, about 10 years. And every year as I'm, I'm getting the reports, I'm going, this is awesome. <laughs> Not only what I put in, but compound interest, and it's growing. I just got my report on June 30th for the last six months. Anybody else get your report? Our fund went down 17.5%. So let me just bring that down to earth for you. If you have $100,000 in your RRSP, just saying if you did, you just lost $17,500. I love the cover letter that they sent out with it. <laughs> and they're Christians who manage our fund. They're great guys and women. And they do a really good job. But one of the things, <laughs> the, the person who was writing it said, you know, it's a good thing I don't put my faith in the stock market. <clears throat> <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe you should. <laughs> okay. The point is, guys, it's rust, moths. You can't count on it. Don't is what Jesus is getting at here. So it's important to add at this point, I need to add one caveat here. It's very important. This text, everything Jesus teaches about money and so forth, and especially as we get conclusion today, please don't hear this. It's not wrong to be wealthy. God blesses people with wealth. It's not wrong to put away money for the future, to save money for the future, especially with people living longer today and you finish working, you're going to maybe need it. So it's wise, actually. The point is, what do you do with your wealth now and in the future? That's the point that Jesus is getting at. And so he explains it to us. It says in verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Seems like such a simple flip of the coin, right? 
So the better idea, according to Jesus, is to, in our lifetime here on earth, focus instead on laying up treasures in heaven where they are completely secure now and will be for eternity. And then he adds what I like to call the super principle of life. If you're going to get a bumper sticker, put something on your fridge, this should be the one. It should be at least one of them where he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Man. The key word is, of course, heart. And it refers here not to our human affections, the things or even persons whom we love. When the, when the Bible speaks, especially here, uh, uh, about the heart in this relationship, it, it's speaking about your inner person. It, it's speaking about your core of who you are at your core. So this means that Christ is telling us that where our treasure is, that is where we will find our total being, our true self, the good life that Jesus has for us is where we will find it. And that, of course, is true flourishing. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus finds himself confronted. It's a a parallel passage to a certain extent. He's confronted by a young man who asks him to tell his brother to divide the inheritance with him. He just interrupts Jesus while he's preaching and says, hey, by the way, my older brother, which was the tradition in the Jewish family, has gotten the inheritance, but I want him to divide it with me now. Can you do something about that? Well, Jesus replies, first of all, by saying, look at who made me judge or arbiter between you guys. But then he lays this down. And I remember hearing this first many years ago. This got me at 40 years of age. He said, take care. And be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So the key word here is covetousness. Now, unfortunately for many of us, we know that the commandment, right, thou shalt not covet. And so we get the idea, it's about the the sin of covetousness is the sin of wanting something that belongs to someone else, whether it's their possessions or their wife, right? Right? And so we think that's what is being meant here, but it's actually not. The word in the Greek means something different. And and, and the reality is, and I'm not trying to get geeky with you here, but you actually know the Greek word that's used here for covetousness in this text. You all know it because you know the opposite of the word. Now, can anyone tell me what the disorder is that usually affects young women where they begin to see themselves in a mirror or on a a picture on an iPhone, and all of a sudden they think they have more weight than they should have, and they start losing weight and losing weight and losing weight, and it can become serious. Anyone know what that is called? Anorexia nervosa. So the opposite word is anorexia, which literally means less than enough. The Greek word for covetousness here in this text is pleonexia, which literally means an unhealthy desire for more than enough. So yes, it's covetousness, which, remember, is a sin. It is a sin. So I know many of you have known a little bit about my story, so I just want to share briefly with you just an example of this. I was around 40 years of age, had a chain of stereo stores in Vancouver, uh, eight stores, two of which I owned corporately, six franchises. Things were going great. I was on the way to my dream at 40 years of age of becoming a millionaire. That's what I had decided when I went into my business career early on in my life. And, and then two things happened which were really weird. Number one, a man came to the church that I was only going to occasionally at the time. And he was a really good preacher. He was a doctor. And he decided to take me out for lunch one day. And one of the first things he said to me at lunch is, Glenn, I see you. You know, come to church every once in a while. You have a lovely little family. And I know you have this great business that's going great. But can I just be honest with you? I said, Sure. Dr. Doug Yackel, he passed away a year ago, he's a great mentor to me. He said, Glenn, I think you're wasting your life. And I always joke and say, check please. (laughs) But he came into my life. We started a men's Bible study in my home because I was like, okay, what what does this all mean? And and I heard him preach and I really respected him. Well, at the same time, uh, all of a sudden, cross-border shopping started happening because of the difference in Canadian dollar. And my business that that was really doing well started to struggle. And then these guys called the Future Shop opened up. Big boxes. And listen, within 18 months, we lost it all. 
It, it, went, it, it left that fast. In fact, during our, our Bible studies in our home, the guys were praying for me and praying for the business for the longest time, and then Doug at one point said, Glenn, I think we need to pray that God would take it away. Check, please. <laughs> and we did. And then within six weeks, I had to close up shop, sell everything off. Lost $250,000. It's never good when you're selling things off, okay? We had to sell our home in order to avoid personal bankruptcy. And so at 40 years of age, Janice and I started all over again. I went into full-time ministry for a brief stint at Union Gospel Mission right after that, went back into the marketing world for a few years, and then 10 years later, God called me to full-time ministry as a pastor and church planter here in Squamish. Listen, all to say, I got the T-shirt on this one, big time. And all to say, God is so faithful, so faithful. We are better off today, not out of what I have done or any of our ingenious plans than we ever were based on my ingenious plans. Jesus goes on in verses 22 and 23 to say this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? People hear these verses, read these verses, and they're like, what? (laughs) Where did this, what, hello? Like really in a nutshell, it's simply this. And they would have understood this kind of colloquial language in that day. But but Jesus is essentially saying, look, this, this thing called covetousness, which is, let's just call it what it is, greed, most people don't see it coming. They're completely oblivious to it. And, and frankly, most people are like, well, not me. I'm not greedy. It's those rich people who are greedy. Not me, right? I was listening to a, a podcast not too long ago where Pastor Tim Keller, one of my favorites, was talking with his wife, and he was sharing about how he did a men's group series one time called Seven Deadly Sins. Right, and his wife asked him at one point, are you advertising in advance um, what, what the subject is going to be for the next one? And he goes, well, yeah, of course we are. And she goes, well, when are you doing greed? And he goes, next week. And she goes, your attendance is going to drop by half. And it did. And that was Keller's explanation to my point was most of the men in that church didn't think that was their problem. Most of us don't think we're greedy. Listen, you don't have to be wealthy to be greedy. You just need to want to be wealthy. It's the same difference. Point number three, greater than your financial need. This is a key verse. Jesus concludes this passage with, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So Jesus concludes his teachings on treasures by making a very, very emphatic statement. No person, no one can serve two masters. And he makes it also emphatically clear who the two masters are in this situation. God or money. Not God or another person. God or money. And and so what is Jesus saying here? What's he doing? He's giving you and I a choice isn't he? He's given us a choice. Choose me. Choose your heavenly father or go ahead. I don't recommend it, but choose money. Some of your Bibles may translate it as mammon, which literally it's an Aramaic kind of uh, alliteration of the Greek that the Greek is used, but also implies the same thing, a greedy pursuit of wealth. So Jesus offers an you and I a choice, and, and since we cannot serve two masters, we have to choose, consciously choose one or the other that we will serve every day and with our lives. And so in conclusion today, let me suggest a few practical applications and answer the question that comes out of our sermon title. What is our greatest treasure? First, have you ever fasted? You know what? It, it's kind of gone out of vogue, even in the church. Do you know that? It, it has. Or, or when was the last time you have fasted? I mean, I could ask a lot of questions around that, but can I just encourage you? Fast. If you want to learn more about it, talk to myself or my wife Janice when she gets back next week, or Rudy. Talk to Rudy especially. He loves fasting. 
He does. And you can learn about fasting. Secondly, when it comes to your struggles with material needs and financial needs, let me simply say, the Word of God gives ample assistance (laughs) on how to deal with that best. One key way, listen, is to recognize that all that you have, all that I have, comes from Him anyway. In a sense, in essence, it's all his. All your material possessions are blessings to you. Sure, you worked for them. Sure, you went out and bought them. But they're from his hand. They are from his hand. And so we need to recognize that first of all. And to help us avoid, listen, help us to avoid making that our treasure or idol, God has actually instituted something. Do you know what that is? Oh, you're going to love this in conclusion. Yeah, it's called Giving. It's called tithing in the Old Testament, giving in the New Testament. Call it whatever you want. But just listen, like the main idea of fasting being the denying of our physical need for food, or here's one, denying our need for social media, that would be a good one to fast from, is meant to teach us self-control and our total reliance for our sustenance, so too does giving. He made it actually really simple with the idea of a tithe. It's a tenth, right? And so I always tell people, let's say you get a check for $1,500, right? Just move the decimal point. It's 150 bucks. Give it away. Give. God made it simple. Why? Does he need your money? No. Why? At the end of the day, God wants you and I to realize that it's his first of all and this. Listen, you can live on the other 90% if you Trust me, says God. You can, but it's also an antidote. Antidote to consumerism and materialism. It'll teach you much. So this is one very clear way that you and I will be laying up treasure in heaven by giving, listen, not only our money, but of our time and our talent and, yes, our treasure, our money. So life's greatest treasure, what could that possibly be? What do you think? I think you all know what life's greatest treasure really is, but let me try and stir your hearts a little with the answer. Every earthly treasure demands this from you and me. Every one of them. Every earthly treasure basically says this. Give your life to purchase me. Work hard, work harder so you can get me. Spend your life dreaming about me and then give your life to making more money than you need so that you can either have me or keep me. Jesus says, I am the one treasure that you need who died to purchase you. So have you you ever thought of what Jesus is treasure is? It's us. We are his treasure. He gave sacrificially of his life to purchase your forgiveness, to give you and I eternal blessings and riches beyond our wildest imaginations. That's the way Jesus gave. He gave, listen, sacrificially. It hurt him to give like that. So let me leave you with this today. Our giving back to him should be in the same way. It should be sacrificial, and it should hurt. But oh, the blessings. (laughs) Oh, the blessings. Pray with me, would you?